With Ken Branagh's remake of Murder on the Orient Express due out next month, I thought it would be a fun idea to quickly run through previous adaptations of this story to see what the new one has to match. Yeah, you really thought this was going to be a Halloween episode, didn't you? Psych! Murder on the Orient Express is regarded by many to be one of Agatha Christie's best novels. The story of the world-renowned Hercule Poirot piecing together the puzzle of a murder that's both simple and complex has been adapted for stage, screen and satire many times over. But there's only really been three straight adaptations made specifically for film and television. EMI financed the first feature-length motion picture in 1974. This particular adaptation was directed by Sidney Lumet, who's best remembered for movies like Twelve Angry Men, Network and The Verdict. Being a big Hollywood film, it boasts a big Hollywood cast, including Martin Balsam, Vanessa Redgrave, Michael York, John Gielgud, Lauren Bacall, Ingrid Bergman and Albert Finney as Hercule Poirot. That's a pretty big list of names. Oh, and did I mention Sean Connery is in this film too? The movie itself was produced on a very tight budget, the modern equivalent of just under $7 million. But having said that, the production values are still pretty good, offering up a good balance of glamour and darkness while not coming across as downright cheap. It's far from spectacular, I'll admit, but considering the locations are some of the most unglamorous parts of Paris and the French Alps, it looks and even sounds a lot more expensive than it really is. I say sounds because the music in this film is amazing. That's Richard Rodney Bennett conducting the Royal Opera House Orchestra, and it puts you in the perfect mood for the most prestigious train service in Europe, if not the world. In terms of cinematography, there is a fair amount of 70s mist in some of the shots, like a lot of gritty films had in those days, but it does help to remind us that while the train is glamorous, the crime scene is really not. The acting is really good, with an Oscar-winning performance from Ingrid Bergman who delivers her interview with Poirot in just one shot. That being said, I can appreciate that it may not be for everybody. Some say that Albert Finney's performance as Poirot was a bit over the top, loud, or just not David Suchet, but honestly, he's probably one of the few mainstream actors of the era who could pull this role off. Considering the producers were also seeking Alec Guinness and Paul Schofield to play the part, it's difficult to imagine either of those actors in a role with such distinction and energy. I mean, if Alec Guinness was in this role, would you honestly see Poirot or Colonel Nicholson trying to play Poirot without sounding like Colonel Nicholson? And to be fair, it did help introduce a lot of contemporary moviegoers to an actor who was normally found on stage in those days. Overall though, the 1974 film does depict the story with just the right mix of emotion. It's glamorous, but dramatic. It's simple, but effective. It has a strong balance of light and of shade. And although the casting and performances may not be to everybody's liking, it's still a highly recommended, faithful adaptation which even had Agatha Christie's seal of approval. Then we cut to the real antithesis in 2001 with the made-for-TV adaptation from Artistry Home Entertainment. It was rubbish! Why was this? Because there were so many updates and changes that it no longer felt like the complex, thrilling story it was trying to tell. Instead of being set in the 1930s, it was set in modern times. Now, despite being an advocate for faith when it comes to adaptations of existing work, I actually think it's quite a fun idea to tell a classic story with classic characters in a modern setting. It just has to work in a way that benefits the story and the characters without being completely pointless. But on this occasion, it doesn't benefit the story and the characters, and it's completely pointless. The only real creative changes are to allow Poirot, played this time by Alfred Molina, to run through Ratchet's threats on VHS tapes and review his suspect's connections with the crime scene on a laptop. Okay, two things wrong with this. One, it's not his laptop. It belongs to a Bothnod who he managed to antagonise to begin with and then suddenly convinced to hand it over. Kind of a sudden change of emotion there, don't you think? Two, he seems to have gained access to the internet just fine, but the passengers couldn't get a signal on their mobile phones. Doesn't that seem a bit odd to you? But the plot changes are nowhere near as distracting as the poor production values. Instead of being filmed in Europe, it's obvious that the railway scenes were shot in the UK on a very tight budget. 
even more so than the 1974 film. How can you tell? Because the train is made up of British Pullman coaches being pulled by a Class 47 diesel with stock US sound effects. There's no snow, so the snowdrift is substituted with a highly unconvincing landslide which honestly looks like it was planted there. It just feels as though all the glamour has been removed from this very glamorous train. Some of the cast has been changed up as well. The 12 suspects are reduced to 8 and Princess Dragomirov in this version is referred to as Senora Alvaredo of South America, but no explanation is really given for this. But the biggest deviation from the source material comes in the form of Poirot having a love interest. We are such opposites, Vera and I. She's flamboyant and beautiful, I'm reserved and homely. She's a thief, I'm a detective. <laughs> The only thing we have in common is our refusal to let the other rule our life, but I can't stop her ruling my thoughts. And there's the biggest question. What on earth is Poirot doing with a romance in this film? I mean, Christie did pen the occasional running in with Princess Rosikoff over the years, so the adaptation to Vera Rosikoff is a nice tie-in. But isn't the point of Poirot supposed to be a man who's married to his work of solving complicated crimes? He's the world's most distinguished private detective, not James Bond. I wouldn't mind so much if it added to the main story, but like the modern setting, it more or less comes out of nowhere and ends with very little payoff. It's just a pointless distraction. I must confess I never expected to see the great Hercule Poirot suffering such a common malady as love. The only thing I can say to the film's credit is that despite being portrayed as much younger, Alfred Molina looks somewhat like Poirot might have been when he was younger, with a vaguely resembling build, moustache and hair. Admittedly, he looks more like Borat's overweight twin brother than the world's greatest detective, but he still looks more like the part than Ken Branagh. You could argue it started with innocent intentions, but sadly the AHE TV adaptation suffers from an apparent lack of budget and a poor script with unnecessary changes that just makes it look and feel cheap. If the 2017 film really is going to be worse than this, it'll be a bigger shock than the Lego movie actually turning out to be amazing. Finally, we come to the feature-length episode of ITV's Poirot in 2010, which thankfully managed to do the story a fair degree of justice. The cast is pretty good overall, with David Suchet doing his job as Poirot, the supporters are all pretty solid, and Toby Jones is a pretty unlikable individual. And he plays a good ratchet as well. The production values are on par with Poirot's usual standards, but some of the visuals are both a strength and a weakness. This involved overlaying the Neen Valley Railway Standard 5, yeah, don't say it, I know, a British rail engine in 1930s Turkey, big whoop, and blue train coaches on CGI sets and backgrounds in some of the long shots, which although they have the best intentions, are probably the weakest part of the film. There's a few shots where the smoke textures and flat backgrounds give it away as being television CGI, which is already ageing pretty badly. But on the other hand, the practical effects in this film are really good. The interior shots captivate the level of claustrophobia as experienced by the passengers, the fake snow looks convincing, and the pacing and cinematography, while coming across as a little more dramatic than glamorous, do fit the atmosphere and tone of this story without ripping off the other two adaptations. It's pretty serviceable overall, though one observation I will say as a change to the story is the ending. I'll try not to give too much away, but in the novel and the 74 film, it's implied that the passengers all did it, but Poirot elects for a simpler solution of hit and run, judging the 12 passengers as the jury instead of the executioners. But in the Suchet film, it's made crystal clear that the passengers are guilty, but it's not made entirely clear which solution Poirot actually goes for. You kind of get an idea which one he gives to the police, and his reluctance to do so is very much played up both before and after his conclusion, but the film ends with the audience somewhat left to their own devices. It's not so much a who done it, but a who guessed it. While this would work in an original crime scene, this is an adaptation of an existing work whose conclusions are more… conclusive. It's not really a criticism as far as I'm concerned, but it did bother a lot of people when the film first came out. But having said that, it does allow the Suchet film to stand up in its own merit without ripping the other versions off. I'm probably in the group who prefers the Finney film, but I will happily agree that the Suchet film is still a very commendable adaptation. Overall, we have three very different interpretations of Murder on the Orient Express, with two of a high standard in their own way. 
But whether or not the 2017 version is going to be a match for those is something I will tell you next time. I'm Chris and I'm here to gauge the issue.